Hi and welcome to another story and today we have part three of The Runaway Girls by Jacqueline Wilson continuing from chapter five. We ran and ran and ran. Kitty was smaller and her legs shorter but she was much faster than me. I hung on to her grimly, glad now that I wasn't trussed up in all my petticoats and frock and bonnet. My feet stung on the hard hot pavements but my limbs moved freely in Kitty's ragged dress. She seemed to be running with purpose, though not in a direct way straight down every road. She dodged down alleyways and back closes and once sprang over a brick wall. It was not a very high one, but I had to take three runs at it before I managed to hitch myself over. And then I landed badly with straight legs so that I jarred my whole body. I would normally have stopped and cried bitterly, but this was a desperate situation and I simply had to keep on going. My breath was rasping now, my chest hurting and my stomach knotted with pain. But I gritted my teeth and carried on, on and on and on. Then at last we came to a park, not the trim little park near the Crescent, but a bigger, wider place. There was a great gated entrance with a park keeper consulting his pocket watch, a set of keys in the other hand. Kitty ignored him and ran further down the pavement beside the railings while I staggered after her. She followed the railings around the corner and then found two iron posts that had buckled, leaving a small gap. Through here, she said, demonstrating. She was through with one squirm of her small body, and then she ducked down and tunnelled through the thick hedge until she was out onto the other side in the park, out of sight. Kitty, I cried, terrified that she was going to run off and leave me all alone. Shh, come on, she hissed through the hedge. But the gap's too small for me, I protested. No, it isn't. You can do it. Try, she commanded. I bent down and put my head through the gap in desperation, ramming it fiercely between the two posts. But then I was trapped. I couldn't get any further because my shoulders were too wide. I tried to pull my head back, but it wouldn't budge now. I'm stuck, I gasped. Oh, help, help, help. I was going to be stuck here forever, half in and half out. I was horribly conscious that a lot of bare leg was showing now, possibly even my behind. No, you're not, said Kitty, scrambling back to look at me. Go sideways. Twist round, stupid. My eyes filled with tears now, hating her calling me stupid, when she was a street girl and couldn't even read properly, and I'd rescued her from the horrible constable and run away from my own papa to be with her. Don't cry, said Kitty, and she wiped a tear away gently with the back of her hand. Move your shoulders and squeeze around slowly. You can do it, I promise. I tried moving inch by inch, slotting one shoulder through the gap and then the other. Kitty seized hold of me and pulled with a sudden jerk. I shot through the railings like a cork out of a bottle. There, she said, now creep under the hedge. But it's all dirty, I protested, though I was filthy already and a little earth wasn't going to make much difference. I crawled alongside her and then straightened up every single part of me sore and aching, but even so I was overcome with the beauty of this park. It was wild and overgrown, with yellow and white and purple flowers scattered throughout the long grass, not planted in rows in specially dug earth. I could see there were more formal gardens further away, but I liked this park much more. The gardens were very empty. Where were all the people you usually saw in any park? The strolling couples, the elderly, elderly ladies walking their dogs, the children with their hoops and balls. Then the significance of the keeper with the key keys dawned on me. This park's closed, I said, peering all around. Yes, said Key. Great timing. But we're not supposed to be here. We'll get into trouble, I said. She burst out laughing. Stop it. You're forever laughing at me and it's very rude, I said. Well, really, just listen to you. We'll get into trouble indeed. We're in far worse trouble already. Well, I am. If those constables get me, they'll lock me up for kidnapping, said Kitty. But that's ridiculous. We'll simply tell them the truth, I said. And they'll believe you, said Kitty, eyebrows raised. For goodness sake, Lucy, your own family didn't believe you, didn't even recognise you. How come your papa didn't know you? Don't, don't you give a fig about you? Of course he does. He loves me very much. He's just a little short-sighted, I said fiercely. Papa certainly did wear little spectacles when he read his newspaper. Oh, perhaps that really was the truth. Oh, of course, he... He'd know me if he could see me properly. Maybe I'd just been a blur to him. It was wondrously comforting to think it. Is there something wrong with his hearing too? Kitty asked relentlessly. You spoke to him loud and clear. Stop it, Papa. She was imitating my voice and I hated it. How dare she mock me? What was I doing running away with this dirty mocking girl? Why are you being so horrid to me when I rescued you from that awful constable pulling your hair? I demanded. I'm not being horrid. I don't mean to be anyway. I'm very, very grateful you rescued me. He was a real brute. Kitty rubbed her wild curls ruefully. Look, he must have yanked out a whole lock. I've got a bowl patch now, see? She parted her hair and I saw a circle of scalp as big as a farthing. 
Oh my goodness, you poor thing. It must have hurt dreadfully, I said. I could take it, said Kitty, swaggering a little. That bad man used to beat us, and I never cried thou out once. I know I'd cry, I said. What are we going to do if the park keeper catches us here? He won't. He'll have gone home to his family. There's nobody here but us now. And all the animals, she said. Animals, I said, alarmed. I peered around, imagining bears and wolves and wildcats, rabbits and squirrels and mice and stoats and hedgehogs and weasels and badgers and rats, said Kitty. I didn't mind rabbits and squirrels, but I wasn't at all sure about the others, especially the rats. Kitty saw my face. They'll be hiding in the grass. You won't see them, she said reassuringly, and we'll be high above them anyway. Let me show you my special place. So you know this park already? I asked. Of course I do. I come here lots. With those other children, the ones playing hopscotch. No, this is my secret place where I want to be on my own. It's like the real countryside. I pretend I'm with gaffers sometimes, just like the old days, Kitty said softly. You don't mind me coming here with you, I wondered. Am I, am I your friend now? Kitty shrugged. Sort of. Only you're rich and I'm poor, so we can't really be friends, can we? Yes, we can, I said. I didn't care if she mocked me. I wanted a friend so much. Then I'll be Lady Kitty and I'm inviting you to my summer dwelling, said Kitty grandly. And I'm Lady Lucy Lockett and I shall be delighted to say yes, please, I said. Then pray come with me, said Kitty giggling. She led me along the wild edges of the park into a little wooded part. I thought she was going to point out a yew, but these trees were very different to the ones in the crescent. They're oaks, said Kitty, and very old. Gaffer always said they are the king of trees. It's where the fairies live. He used to show me the little fairy hats. Oh, those little cup things on the acorns, I said. I tried to eat one once because it looked like a nut, but nurse said it was poisonous. And the fairies wear them when they go out at night, said Kitty. I stared at her incredulously. You surely don't still believe in fairies, I said. Of course I do, said Kitty. She put her hand over my mouth. Shush now, or they'll hear you and take offence. She whispered. Gaffer said, you must take care never to insult a fairy or they'll torment, torment you dreadfully. She seemed to be serious. She was such a strange girl. She seemed so, so much older than me in many ways and yet so much younger too. Perhaps this was another pretend game. It was so lovely to find someone to play with. Nurse had done her best, but I could sense she was only making things up for my benefit. Kitty's eyes were dark and dreamy and she told me all the tricks fairies might play on me if I annoyed it. Their favourite game was sticking their victim all over with their green spears. Like this, she said, and she picked a hairy green head from a hedgerow plant and aimed it at my hair. Hey, I said laughing, trying to comb it out with my fingers. Kitty did it for me and then wound her finger around and round inside one of my ringlets. I like the way your hair curls, she said. It's not like this naturally, I said. I have it in curling papers every night. Nurse used to do it for me and she was quite gentle. But Miss Groan pulls dreadfully and makes my whole head ache. If you put these curling papers in my hair, would it go smooth and shining like yours? Kitty asked. Well, it might, I said, a little doubtfully. But I think you might need to wash it first. Kitty was in need of a very thorough scrub all over, but it didn't seem to bother her. There was something else that was bothering me dreadfully. Lady Kitty, does your dwelling happen to have a closet? I asked. A closet? Kitty asked, looking puzzled. You know, where you can relieve yourself. I whispered, blushing. Oh, well, of course, Lady Lucy, here we are, she said, gesturing to a clump of ferns. They need watering. Yes, but I can't go outside like this. Someone might look, I said. Oh, yes, this park is very crowded now, with people all around us, said Kitty, gesturing at the grass and the paths and the flower beds all deserted. You'll look, I said. Yes, I might, said Kitty mischievously. Stop teasing me. Well, stop being so silly. I walked reluctantly to the ferns. Kitty turned her back. I lifted her ragged dress and tried to go, but it was impossible. Haven't you been yet? Kitty asked, her back still turned. I can't, I said. I'll have to wait until we go somewhere with a proper closet. Then you'll be waiting a long time because we're going to be staying here all night long, said Kitty. I was already in agony. If I waited all night, I'd likely blow up and burst. Well, could you please walk further away? Much further than that, so you can't possibly hear me, I begged. She sighed, but sauntered off. I waited until she'd gone far into the distance, and then I crouched down and tried again, successfully. Then I straightened up, straightened up and looked for her, so I could wave her back. But she wasn't there. I peered this way and that, shading my eyes from the evening sun, but I couldn't see her anywhere. Kitty, I called. Kitty, you can come back now. Several birds flew out of the hedge. 
startled by my voice. Their flapping wings frightened me, and I ducked down and then felt foolish, ready for Kitty's mocking laugh. But she was silent. Kitty, I shouted, then at the top of my voice, Kitty! Nothing. Come on, the joke's over, I called. Now come back here this instant, or... Or what? I couldn't do anything. I was stuck in this huge, strange park that I'd never known existed. It, it was locked for the night, so I was clearly trespassing. I was going to have to stay here all night long. The sun was already low in the sky. It was getting late, past supper time. It would be bedtime soon. I looked around desperately, but saw no lamps. It was going to be dark, pitch dark. I was so scared of the dark that I had to have a candlestick on my bedside table. If it went out in the middle of the night and I woke up, I'd pull the blankets over my head and cower there. I didn't have a candle or any blankets here. It looked as if I didn't even have Kitty. She'd run off and left me here all alone. What was I going to do? Should I try to find the gap in the railings and somehow find my way home? I could make one more attempt at persuading them that I was Lucy. Papa hadn't believed me and that was like a knife in my heart. But Miss Groan knew me. Would she manage to persuade him that I was telling the truth? Would Papa let me in after all? I could bathe and dress in any of my outfits and then he would see for himself that I was his own Lucy Locket. But did I want to go back to a father who cared so little for his daughter that he couldn't recognise her? To a new mother who disliked me and a nursery governess who had never once smiled at me and corrected me a hundred times a day. If only nurse was still there. I ached for her now. It was all I could do not to cry out her name, though I had just enough sense left to know that she couldn't possibly be within earshot. I shut my eyes and whispered over and over again to her inside my head. Dearest nurse, I miss you so terribly. Please, please come and find me and then we will live together and be happy again. Please, oh please. Then suddenly, someone, su su someone suddenly flung their arms around me and I jumped violently and cried out. Hey, don't tremble so, it's Kitty, she said. Who did you think it was? Oh, Kitty, where were you? Why did you run away? How could you leave me all alone, I cried. You told me to go away while you tinkled, she said indignantly, but not for so long. How could you tease me so? I wasn't long at all, said Kitty, and I wasn't teasing either. I was busy getting our supper. Look, she knelt down beside an unwieldy parcel wrapped in crumpled newspaper. She opened it up with a proud flourish. See? I stared in astonishment at the bottle of ginger beer, the patties, the cake and the orange. Is there a refreshment, re refreshment room in this park? How did you get the money for all this? There are free refreshment rooms all over the park, and they don't cost a bean, said Kitty. They've got a special name, Litter Baskets. I stared at her. Then I looked back at the food. I saw there was a bite or two out of the patties. The cake had a crust of earth, as if it had been dropped in a flower bed. The orange was bruised, and when I held it to the light, I realised that the bottle of ginger beer was only half full. This is food that has been thrown away, I said. We can't eat that, it's dirty. So are we, said Kitty cheerfully. You don't have to eat if you don't want, but I'm going to tuck in. She spread out the newspaper and arranged the food neatly, picking off any dirty bits and peeling the orange, throwing away the bruised segments. Each item was divided carefully in two, with a bottle of ginger beer in the middle. She sat down, cross-legged, and smiled at me invitingly. There. Would you like to uh, join me, Lady Lucy? she asked. It would have been churlish to refuse, and besides, I'd missed my own supper at home. I realised I was starving hungry. I sat down beside her and we ate up every crumb, politely taking it in turns to share the ginger beer. The meal was totally delicious. I was used to such bland food at home. The meat in the patties was wonderfully flavoursome and the pastry rich with butter. The fruitcake was heavy with cherries and sultanas and when the earth was brushed away, the white icing was a marvel, crunchy and very sweet. The orange was juicy and, sh and, sl slacked, and slacked my thirst. And the ginger beer was still fizzy and tasted marvellous straight from the bottle. Thank you so much, Lady Kitty, I said, when I'd finished at last. That was the most excellent feast. You're very welcome, Lady Lucy. Would you care to use my table napkin? She said, passing me a torn off piece of newspaper. I blotted my lips with it, and then she did the same. My maid is having a day off, so I'd better do the clearing up, said Kitty, neatly parceling up the newspaper and the bottle and orange peel, scooping out a patch of earth and giving them a shallow burial. She kept back one large sheet of newspaper. Are we going to read it, Lady Kitty? I asked. You can, if you was feeling the need to show off, said Kitty. I'm keeping a piece handy for any necessary bum wiping. I felt myself blushing to the roots of my hair, but I could see she was only being practical. So, we're actually staying here, I asked uncertainly. For tonight, certainly. 
Them traps might still be prowling about. You know, the constables. Kitty paused. You was brilliant, Lucy. Getting that one off me. You act so nimini piminy, and yet you can be really fierce if you want. I like that. I took that as a great compliment and squared my shoulders, chin up, to look as fierce as possible. We haven't actually got a bed, though, have we? I said. I kept thinking of the rats and stoats and weasels. I knew I would scream like a banshee if they ran across my face in the night. Yes, we have, said Kitty, and she pointed to the biggest oak tree. It towered above us, reaching up to the sky. We're going to climb right up it, I whispered, sounding anything but fierce. Not all the way up to the top, said Kitty, but I can't climb at all, I said. Right then, we'll be birds and fly up, said Kitty. It sounded as if she might be losing patience with me now. I decided to play her at her own game. Then I am Lucy Lark, and I'm very good at singing. Trill, 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 but my wings don't work very well, I said, flapping my arms pathetically. And I am Kitty. Swift, yes, that was always Geffa's favourite bird. I'm Kitty Swift, and I am swift, and the cleverest of all the birds because I can sleep with my eyes open, said Kitty, whirling around and round the tree. So I can protect us if anyone creeps up on us. Only they won't because there's no one else here. Just you and me and we'll be cosily tucked up. You'll see. She sprang at the lowest branch, swung there, kicking her legs in joy and then hauled herself up into it. Now you come up too, she said. I can't, I said, but she made me try. One jump, two jumps. And then on the third jump, I got my hands on the bark and managed to hang there somehow, gasping. That's the ticket, said Kitty. Now cock one leg up and tuck your foot over and pull up. It's easy. She might have found it easy. I found it almost impossible, but I tried and tried until I managed to climb onto the wretched branch. My heart was thudding, and my arms and legs were grazed by the bark. It's no use. I can't go any further, I gasped. You don't have to, said Kitty. Pull yourself along a bit. See that hole? Right there. It's bigger than you think. You can drop right down, and that's it. Our room for the night. And it's already lined with leaves, because I've slept here several times. It was still frightening, dangling my legs down into the dark hole. I imagined a giant squirrel lurking under me, ready to sink its teeth into my bare toes. But there were only soft leaves, as Kitty had said. There wasn't much room for one, so with two of us, it was quite a squeeze. We had to curl up very close together, which was actually very comforting. I hadn't had a cuddle with anyone since Nurse left. You okay? Kitty asked, her breath tickling my cheek. I think so, I said. It was tremendously dark, which I didn't like at all. I clung to Kitty, thinking I'd never sleep a wink, but I started dreaming almost immediately. Chapter 6 It was the same dream over and over. I was standing on the steps and Papa was wagging his finger at me furiously, telling me I wasn't his daughter. I was trying to tell him that I was. Of course I was, but although I moved my lips and strained my throat, no sound came out. I looked down at myself and the burrowed, borrowed ragged dress there, hanging limply, but there didn't seem to be any body inside it. I didn't have any arms, any legs. There seemed nothing to me at all, though I knew I was there. I knew I was Lucy, but I couldn't make myself heard. I couldn't even make myself seen. I woke with a start and couldn't see a thing in the dark. And just for a moment, I thought I'd really disappeared. But then I felt Kitty's warm body beside me, heard her soft snores and remembered. Kitty, can you hear me? I said into her ear and she mumbled indistinctly. I couldn't catch what she said, but she could hear me. She could feel my arm going around her because she burrowed into me like a little animal, still asleep. I was lulled a little, but then I started remembering everything properly. I thought of Ermintrude's melted face, my days of disgrace, and then the sudden leap of my heart when I thought I saw Nurse from the window. I longed to hear her de dear husky voice saying, There, there, Miss Lucy, you've just had a nasty dream. It's all right, my dearie. Nursey's here. But she wasn't here with me in the nursery, and I wasn't here. I was huddled in a tree with a wildlife rustling all around me. The only friend I had in the world was Kitty, and I still wasn't certain she wouldn't run off and leave me. Then I slept and woke again, and felt for Kitty, but she wasn't there. It was no longer pitch dark now, and I could see I was crouched in the hollow by myself. I struggled to stand up, stiff and aching, but managed to haul myself out into the daylight. It was a beautiful day, the sun warm already, the sky a brilliant blue, and a light breeze gently rustling the leaves on the trees. A bird with a forked tail flew high above me. Was it a swift? I watched it until my eyes blurred and it disappeared. I hauled myself out onto the branch and sat there trying to pluck up the courage to jump down. I did it at last and tumbled over, but didn't hurt myself. Kitty, I called. Kitty, you haven't left me, have you? I waited, staring in every direction, but there was no sign of her. I hoped she might be looking for a little basket, breakfast for us, but I couldn't be sure. 
I relieved myself in the ferns again and wished I could scrub myself clean and put on proper clothes. How could I go out of the park and show myself to people when I looked such a sight? I wondered when the park keeper came along with his keys and opened the gate to the general public. I should make myself scarce before, the, before he came and caught me. But where would I go? How would I manage? Kitty, I wailed. Kitty, Kitty. Meow. Someone replied. Oh, Kitty, where are you? You bad girl, I called, limp with relief. Here I am, she said, running out of the shadows under the trees. Sorry to worry you. You were sleeping so soundly I didn't like to wake you. She was clutching something to her chest. Have you found some breakfast? I asked hopefully. Had to do a whole round of litter baskets. I could have fed myself 20 times over, but I knew how fussy you are, Lady Lucy. Turning up your nose at a little bit of hot, honest dirt. I found some ham that seemed promising, but it tasted a tad rancid, so I didn't think that would do either. So it's cake again, and it's gone a bit hard, but it was so well wrapped it hasn't got a speck of dust on it. Couldn't find any leftover pop in any of the bottles, but I've got a couple of tomatoes in this bag. They'll slake our first, she declared, setting out at our picnic. It's very good of you, Kitty, and I'm sure it will be delicious, I said. In actual fact, I gobbled up the strange breakfast with relish. I would normally never dream of eating stale sponge cake and an overripe tomato, especially for breakfast, but I had an extraordinary appetite now. When I was finished, I had crumbs all around my mouth and tomato juice all over my hands. I wrung them uncomfortably. Just wipe them on your dress, said Kitty. But they'll make it all dirty, I said. I don't care. It's my dress, said Kitty. I rubbed them on the grass instead because the dress was already dreadfully stained. My hands still felt horribly sticky. I wish we had some way of washing, I said, sighing. Ah, let's see now. What time would you say it was, said Kitty. I haven't got a pocket watch, I said. Don't need one of them, said Kitty. She squinted up at the sun. I reckon it'll be a good hour and a half before that keeper comes to open the park. Time for us to take our bath, Lady Lucy. You mean pretend to take a bath, I asked uncertainly. Well, that wouldn't get you very clean, would it, Lady Fussy Guts, said Kitty, her eyes sparkling. Come with me. She led me towards the flower beds and carefully mown lawns. I felt more self-conscious than ever about my appearance and kept glancing around nervously in case anyone was peering at me in horror. Although I knew we still had the park to ourselves. We seemed to be walking for quite a while and I was worried that Kitty's timekeeping was simply guesswork. If the keeper unlocked the gates and did an early patrol of his park, then he could easily spot us. Kitty, are you sure we've got plenty of time? I asked anxiously. I've never known anyone who's such a worry, she said, clucking at me. We have oodles of time and we're very nearly there. She took me down a long laburnum archway, casting a golden yellow shade, and there at the end of it was a boating lake. It was a circle of clear blue-grey water gleaming in the sunshine. The small rowing boats were tied up neatly to a little jetty. There was a hut with a notice saying it cost sixpence per adult. Children only a penny. Oh dear, we haven't got any pennies, I said. There's nobody there to take our money. And anyway, we're not going to make take one of them boats. We're going for a swim, said Kitty. That's even better than a bath, isn't it? But we haven't got any bathing costumes either, I said. Oh, for goodness sake, said Kitty, exasperated. She pulled her shift over her head, took one leap and landed in the water with a big splash. She frolicked about, the shallow water only coming up to her waist, shrieking with delight. Jump in, Lucy, she called. I stood at the water's edge, wavering. I couldn't possibly leap about naked like Kitty, yet the water looked so inviting and I longed to get properly clean. Should I jump in wearing my dress? It certainly seemed a good wash, but then how would I get it dry? It would drip all day long. I couldn't get the dress wet but skin would dry in the sunshine in no time. I suddenly tugged the frock off and jumped in too. It was far colder than I thought it would be, and I screamed in surprise. But I was soon leaping about and splashing like Kitty. I wonder what on earth Miss Groan would say if she could see me now. Her beady eyes would pop right out of her head. But Miss Groan wasn't here. I was free. Come in deeper, Lucy, Kitty called. I waded towards the middle of the pond, greatly daring, until the water came up to my shoulders. That's the ticket. Now let's swim. I'll race you to the other side, said Kitty, jumping up and down to keep warm. I don't really know how to swim, I said. It's easy, said Kitty. I thought she might be pretending again, but she glided over to me and then swam around me with strong, even strokes, her legs splashing behind her. Oh, my goodness, you can swim, I said, tremendously impressed. Gaffer showed me how, said Kitty. I've been swimming right from when I could walk. Gaffer said I was like a little fish. Can you show me then, I asked. Kitty did her best but I was nervous and clumsy and I couldn't really get the hang of it. She tried to support me, but my legs dropped and I didn't dare take them off the bottom. Never mind, you'll learn soon, but why don't you flip over onto your back and float for a little, said Kitty. Look, like this. 
She lay down and floated as easily as a leaf. I could never do that, I said, but she insisted that I try. So I flipped over and let my hair drift around my head. Kitty took hold of my legs and held them up. Don't let go, I said anxiously. Stick out your stomach, that's it. Now you'll find your legs will float by themselves, said Kitty. Said Kitty. Do you promise, I begged. Promise, 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 said Kitty, and she let my legs go. I was ready to sink like a stone, but I stayed floating. It was as easy as lying on my back in bed, and yet I had clear water instead of a mattress. Oh, I'm doing it. I'm doing it, I said. I'm like a mermaid. It's wonderful. Kitty lay on her back beside me and we floated together, staring up at the blue sky and all my worries and anxieties drifted away. I'm so happy, I said. I am too, said Kitty. Let's stay here floating forever and ever, I said. Maybe for ten minutes more and then we'll have to get out and scarper before the park opens, said Kitty. It's not a park anymore. I am Lady Lucy and you are Lady Kitty and we live here in our treehouse and this is our very own lake and we won't allow anyone into our grounds. This is our magic place just for us, I said. I shut my eyes and wished it were true of all my heart, but now I was conscious of the minutes ticking by. I didn't protest when Kitty gave me a little tug and started wading out of the pond. I followed her, starting to shiver when we stepped onto the grass, and conscious again that I was totally bare. We have to run about now, said Kitty. So we ran as fast as we could, round and round the boating lake, first one way and then the other, when we started to get dizzy. The sun was already hot, but I still stayed soaking wet. We'd better dress anyway, said Kitty. I don't think we've got too much time left. She shrugged on her flimsy shift and ran her fingers through her wet curls. She looked so different now she was clean, younger and sweeter. I suddenly imagined her in a proper frock and stockings and shiny shoes and saw she could easily be taken for a gentleman's daughter if she only chose to speak properly. Whereas I looked anything but, even though I was moderately clean again, I tried to arrange my own hair, but the last vestige of ringlets had disappeared. My hair hung long and lank to my shoulders, and I couldn't untangle it without a brush. I knew I looked awful in Kitty's stained, torn frock. I sighed miserably as I tugged it this way and that, hating the coarse feel of it on my body, missing my soft, clean petticoats. What's the matter? Have you got a pain? Kitty asked. I couldn't really tell her that I hated wearing her filthy, ugly frock, because it would sound so rude and ungrateful. I was just wishing that hateful woman had left me some petticoats, I said. It feels very odd without them, and my feet are so sore now without boots. I stood on one leg like a heron and examined one. It was scratched badly, with several deeper cuts where I'd trodden on sharp stones. Oh dear, look, are you scratched too, Kitty? She shook her head and showed me. Her soles seemed as tough as leather, without a mark on them. I'm used to going barefoot, she said, but I think we're going to have to get you some footwear. Don't want some cuts getting worse or you'll be hobbling. But who will we get them? Who will get them for me? I said. I haven't got any money. Don't you worry. I'll buy them for you, said Kitty. I'll fetch you some money. You've got money? I asked, astonished. I told you. It just needs fetching, said Kitty. She spoke with such conviction that I believed her. Really? Oh, I'd love some proper boots and stockings, too, so they don't rub my feet, and drawers and petticoats, and maybe, maybe a frock, too, so I can give yours back. Just a cheap plain frock, it needn't have a lace trim, and, and I can do without a pinafore, I said. Will there be enough money for a frock, do you think? I dare say, given time, said Kitty. She put her arm around me. Don't worry, Lucy, stick with me, I'll get you anything you want, but we must scarp her now. She led us all the way back to the broken railings. I hated having to crawl through the hedge, getting my hands and knees filthy all over again, but it couldn't be helped. I had learned the trick of sliding through sideways now, and squeezed through the narrow gap without too much trouble. That's the ticket, said Kitty. We straightened up and walked down the pavement together, hand in hand. We turned into a narrow side road, where there were many men in caps hurrying to a big factory. I was still damp and dishevelled, but no one made me any, paid me any attention whatsoever. This seemed very strange. When I went out for my walk with Miss Groan, I was used to working men, doffing their caps to me and moving respectfully to the side of the pavement. These men brushed past me without a second glance. There were women in coarse clothing and aprons, but none of them bobbed their heads either. One of them impatiently gave me a shove towards the gutter. Out my way, you dozy little kid. Some of us have work to go to, she snapped. How dare you push me like that, I said indignantly. She stared at me, and I thought for a moment she was going to raise her great red arm and give me a blow about the head. But then she cackled with laughter. You're a rum one, she said. That voice, you sound like a real toff, you do. For a moment, I wondered whether to catch hold of her and tell her that I was truly a little lady and had been set upon by thieves but then she might call a policeman or try to take me home myself was that what i wanted 
had enough sense to see that I went, if I went home, I'd never ever be allowed to see Kitty again. She was my true friend now. I'd never had a friend before. She was so brave, so lively, so full of fun, and she looked after me. I loved her only second to nurse. Kitty was looking at me, her eyes narrowed. It was almost as if she were reading my mind. I gave her a little reassuring smile and marched past the rude woman. We walked on, Kitty and me, keeping step in our bare feet. We went down a very narrow street of shabby tenement houses, huddled together, some so old they were propped up with great posts. There were lines strung between them, and one woman was already hanging her washing on one. The clothes were almost as ragged as ours, but the tattered sheets were scrubbed white, though, already gathering smuts from the factory chimney. The washerwoman gave Kitty a nod. Haven't seen you round here a bit, little un, she said. Been on my travels, said Kitty. Lost your frock, I see. Lent it to my friend here, said Kitty. I could give you my old one, even if I cut it short, it still swamp you, but it's better than nothing. You look a sad little scrap in that wispy shift, said the washerwoman. That's truly kind, but I reckon the sadder I look today, the better, said Kitty mysteriously. Oh, well, suit yourself, she said. I've got the kettle boiling on the hob indoors. Do you want a cup of char, you and your friend? Yes, please, said Kitty. She nudged me. Yes, please, I said, though I had no idea what char was and wasn't at all sure I liked it. Make it yourselves then, <laughs> when I get this washing sorted, said the washerwoman. Char turned out to be tea. Very strong, with no milk or sugar, served in a chip mug. I couldn't help smold shuddering when I swallowed, but it proved strangely refreshing, and I felt fortified when I'd finished my mug full. Kitty shared hers with a little child of about two, holding her mug out and helping, and helping him sip from it. I could see all too clearly that he was a little boy, because he only wore a shirt. There was a baby lying on a pile of rags in a washing basket, kicking its legs and sucking on an empty bottle. Why is it in a basket? I whispered to Kitty. It's her little cot, said Kitty. Oh, poor thing, I exclaimed. She's happy as a bird in a nest, said Kitty. Here, baby, let me fill your bottle for you. The baby had char too, weakened with cold water. It seemed an unlikely brew for such a small person, but the baby sucked on its bottle greedily. When it had finished, Kitty picked it up and rubbed its back expertly. You're very good with little children. Like a little nurse, I said. I like minding them, said Kitty. Gaffer says I'll make a fine mother in the future. But I'm not bothered. He's the only one I want to look after. So where exactly is he now? I asked. Told you. He's gone away. Kitty mumbled. Ah, Kitty, said the washerwoman coming through the door with her empty basket. You're a brave little kid. Ain't no choice here, have I? said Kitty. You could always stay here for a bit. You could come in useful. Minding my kitty, she said. Nah, I like to be on the move, said Kitty. But thanks all the same. The washerwoman looked at me. She's a stubborn girl, your friend, she said. She's been very kind to me, I said. The woman raised her eyebrows at my voice. What are the likes of you doing hanging around the ki with Kitty? She said. Haven't you got a home to go to? I shook my head. I just go where Kitty goes, I said. Then you'll do all right, she said. She knows what's what, that Kitty. Well, we better get going. Thanks for the char, said Kitty. She bent over the drawer and kissed the baby and then went to kiss the little boy too. He chuckled and ran away behind the battered chair. I can see you, said Kitty, peering over the top. Oh, he's having a tinkle on the floor. Albert, use the pot. How many times do I have to tell you? His mother shouted. Albert wasn't the only one needing to relieve himself. Do you think I might uh, possibly pay a visit? I asked, embarrassed. They stared at me blankly. You know, I lowered my voice, you uh, use the facilities. The washerwoman laughed. Funny way of putting it. Yes, dear, out the back. Show her, Kitty. There was a little hut at the end of the yard. It reeked horribly. It was even worse inside. I felt quite ill when I came out, wondering if I might actually faint. But Kitty dashed in and out without flinching. There's now, she said. Right, let's get some money, girl. And that is where we will leave part three of The Runaway Girls by Jack Jacqueline Wilson. I'll be back soon with lots more stories on my channel. And if you'd like to subscribe or hit a like, that's always appreciated. Thanks for listening, guys. Take care. Bye bye.